Father, we come before you, we praise you, we give you glory. You are our God and King. And this morning, as we dive into your word, as we continue on in this epic journey of scripture, we pray that you would use it to transform our hearts. Those areas of our life where we might fall in line with the things that we witnessed today, would you pierce us just a little bit? Father, for I know some of the things that we're talking about today is characteristics and traits of the fallen human nature that you want to see go by the wayside. Would we taste and see that you are good? Would we desire nothing other than a relationship with you? Would we be fulfilled? Would we be contented? Would we be, you know, at a place where we can just enjoy your presence and savor and be satisfied in you and you alone? In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. So we are going through this epic journey of scripture. We're still in the book of Exodus. We're going to find ourselves in Exodus chapter 16, if you want to go there in just a moment. Um, Today, uh, how many of y'all know Janet Jackson? I know she's not as popular as she used to be, right? Some of us, we, none of y'all know, you know who Michael Jackson is, right? From back in the day. What kind of crowd is this? I don't know what we're talking, am I in the right room today? So did you know that Janet Jackson actually wrote a song about the Israelites? She wrote a song about the Jewish people. It was called, What Have You Done For Me Lately? (laughs) As you're going to see today in Scripture. You're going to see in Scripture. That's a spirit we actually need to combat against a little bit. What have you done for me lately? I think that's going to be one of the big themes that we see in here. There's a close cousin to what have you done for me lately. And I would say that's what's in it for me. What's in it for me? And these are characteristics of the human nature that you're going to see played out here in the book of Exodus that I think still affect us to a great deal today. We all suffer from the ramifications of this fallenness and this sin in our life. And God's trying to do something to build the trust of the Jewish people in him as we dive into scripture today. And also uh, in us, even in our generation, that that would be a spirit that as believers really has no place when you think about it. He calls us to live these selfless lives, these lives where we put other people first. And it's so contrary to who we are that it's a tough thing to do. So the subject material today, maybe it will sting a little bit, maybe it won't. If it does, let it. Let the Lord work it out in you. Let him do his thing. If there's characteristics in our life that don't image him well, would we be the ones to be willing to change to conform to his image and not try to do the other way around? Can I get an amen? So Exodus chapter 16, we dive in right there in verse 1. This is the scene. It says, They set out from Elam, and all the congregation of the people came of Israel came into the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, and the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt, and the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. So the words that really stand out there are grumbling. Or this spirit of discontent that was beginning to rise up. What's going on in this scene? It takes place only one month after they're freed from the land of Egypt. One month after they saw the Red Sea parted. One month after they saw all those miracles that occurred in the land of Egypt to have them depart. It wasn't too long when they got out in the desert. Remember their first grumbling really surrounded water? And now we see them grumbling around uh, food in this particular case. So one of the things I would say, our ability as human beings to grumble is unceasing. I mean, we grumble about everything if we are honest, do we not? I mean, we grumble. I see a lot of heads shaking. The ones whose heads aren't shaking, those other people are grumbling about you. I mean, they know know you. They know you grumble. But maybe what started to happen here, you've seen those Snickers commercials of late, like when they get hangry and they start to have this alter ego going on. So there's actually some truth in what's going on here in the midst of it, though, because it says the whole congregation of Israel was grumbling. They were all getting hungry. They were all trying to figure out what God's doing. Did he bring us out here that we might die? Why did God deliver us in this way? And now we find ourselves out here where seemingly there's no food. So there was a reality that was going on in the midst of it. But God was kind of testing them in the middle of that to see how they would react. He provided for them at every other juncture. He's going to come through on their behalf. you got to know that. But maybe it says something for us too when you're in the middle of that frying pan and you're you're trying to figure out what God's next steps are, like we talked about a few weeks ago, don't go try to get it on your own. Let God do his thing. Let him work even when it seems difficult. Let him do his thing. 
So the supplies they've accumulated are probably starting to dwindle at this point. What's God trying to reveal to them at this moment? Before we answer that question, let's hear a little bit more about their response. Exodus 16, 3. And the people of Israel said to them, What would we have died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full? For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill us, this whole assembly, with hunger. So they're turning up the drama. None of y'all ever do that, do you? We used to occasionally call my son Drama Boy. I'm glad he's not here to see that. But he was great at that. I mean, when things weren't going his way, boy, he would ratchet up the drama. He would be taking it to a whole nother level, trying to prove out whatever point he was trying to make. And I think we all do that from time to time. We up it. So, God, you brought us out here to kill us. But again, remember, they just witnessed all these miracles. It was only a month before. They had just seen all these things that he had done to deliver them, yet what have you done for me lately, right? I mean, this is a month ago. None of y'all have ever done that, right? Things are heading in one direction, and then all of a sudden, like a week later, what? Can't believe it, right? There's this sense inside of us as humans that is being revealed here in Scripture that's something we need to come to grips with, that we need to contend against. They're whining. They're grumbling. You know, I... If I were honest, to give you an honest pastoral moment, you know, one of, the, one of the challenges that we have as pastors to stay open and continue to sow into, to continue to love on all the newer people who walk through the door is this spirit that we're contending with with that. There, I can't tell you the countless number of people that I've married, that I've dedicated their babies, that we've taken through leadership, that we've maybe buried a loved one, and then the new shiny toy church opens up down the street. See ya. What have you done for me lately? It it hurts. I mean, you know, when we take this relationship that we have seriously as believers, it's important. So when you're, maybe you're visiting here today, be called, be sent to a place when you go there. Know that you're there. And if it ever comes a time to leave, you know, take those kinds of decisions seriously. Don't uh, have our church lives be a what have you done for me lately. Don't have our church lives be, you know, what's in it for me. Because that's the opposite of the Christian life. You know, when there's weaknesses in a church, maybe God called you there to fulfill those weaknesses and come in and step into that gap like the verdicts have done to come in and try to take things to the next level. Think in that way. Think in a very different way. Why is God calling me? How does he want to use me? Use your heart skills and abilities to make a difference wherever God plants you. Know where you're planted. Know when God has you in a particular place. Not just in church life, but maybe in many other areas of life. We discard things so easily in our relationships and in our marriages. Maybe, you know, things have actually been going good, but you have the wrong perspective and the wrong viewpoint. And all of a sudden you're complaining and you're grumbling. Life's miserable. All I got to do is wash this guy's dirty laundry every other day. What's wrong with this picture, right? I mean, like we get it. Let me tell you, the grass is not greener on the other side. They'll have stank dirty laundry too. Come on, Jesus, right? And they'll have more issues and you haven't trained them well. So deal with them while you've got them, right? You know, there came a, somebody's like, wow, <laughs> marriage tips. <laughs> there was a time in, in our marriage, Mary Jo and I, we never fight ever. Come on, Jesus. Thank you. We don't really. I mean, thank God. She trained me well over the years. Ladies, come on. But there came a point in our life where Mary Jo was being like the children of Israel. May I invite her to the stage to tell her story, her side of the story, because... I ain't getting in trouble with this one. Ah, all right. Well, if you've been in any of my Bible studies or a small group or have been my friend for any length of time, you have heard this story probably a hundred times, so I'm sorry. But it changed my life and gave me a new perspective, and this is how it went. Um, Eric and I were like 21 years old. We had our little Chewy was a toddler. Miranda was just born, and um, he was going to school full-time and worked full-time. I had two jobs and was going to school part-time. And I just felt like all we were doing was going to school, coming home, going to work, changing diapers. And um, it happened to be a cleaning day that day, so I was cleaning some dirty stank underwear, right? And doing dishes and vacuuming, cleaning, and just doing what I did as a housewife. But I was getting angry, mean. And every hour passed by, I was just getting angrier and angrier. And what has he done for me lately? When he comes home tonight, I'm going to tell him, you need to do more. I 
was honestly in my heart meditating that entire day about how lonely I was and how he doesn't buy me anything. We don't go anywhere. I am bored to death. I feel like I'm living with my brother. And when he comes home tonight, I'm going to tell him. So as his car drives up, I'm out there me, 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 yelling at him. And I will never that's forget. That's how she did it. Yep, that's it. <laughs> Whatever. Um, so what happened was, I, I honestly remember exactly where we were standing in our cute little cottage kitchen when he turned around and looked at me and he, he said, are you kidding me? Are you nuts? Are you serious? And he, one after another, he was saying da 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 all these things that spun my head and gave me a new perspective. He said, look at this house we live in, it's awesome. Uh, you just got a new car. We just came back from a two-week trip to Aspen, Col not Aspen, Breckenridge, Colorado. He says, I come home early once a week and meet you and Matt at the pool, and we swim and have a picnic dinner. I take you out every Friday night, and I will never forget, as he was saying this, I was like, what? I want to be that person. Who's that person? Is that person me? Is that my life? I literally was so focused on everything negative. I had such stinking thinking that when he was saying that I stood in my kitchen and I was humiliated and embarrassed. To the core, I really, I was like, that is my life. And how did I look at it like this when it really is this? He worked his tail end off and he really loved me well. But I remember with all my heart, I'm telling him, I'm not living like this anymore. You're not my brother, you're my husband. And it broke my heart that my vision and where I was looking and why I was complaining and being ungrateful, he'll tell you, I'm a very grateful girl. But it took that moment. Just a couple months after that, we started going to church. We fell head over heels in love with Jesus, fell in love with his word, and I would hold on to scriptures like Philippians 4, 8, where it tells you to think on the, whatever is lovely, whatever is good, whatever is holy, whatever is trustworthy. Think on these things. And I took that to heart. Our battle is in our mind. It's what we think of. It's what we put in. And if you're not coming to church, if you're not being consistent with your Bible, y'all, if you're here, you're going to read the Bible in a year with us. It's going to be awesome. And that's a big thing. That's hard to do. So I just want to say, get your thinker right. Let's not be like the lost, ungrateful, rebellious Israelites that always were looking back and wanted to go back to the junk that they left instead of looking, for the for looking forward. God has a plan and a purpose for each and every one of our lives, and let's not wait 40 years to figure it out. Amen? It's taken me about 30 to figure it out, but come on, Jesus, it's all good. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, I think she brought up a great point that, frankly, I didn't even think of. The, the antidote to this is a spirit of gratitude. I mean, is it not? To be grateful, to look back, Lord, look what you've done for me. Oh, my goodness. To remember that kind of stuff. She said, tell you how she doesn't do that anymore. She doesn't do that anymore. No, she... All right, let's read on down. Because God is going to take care of us. He is going to provide for us. So the question that he's trying to get answered from them is, will you trust me? I think he asks you the same question today. Will you trust him? You trust him with your salvation. Will you trust him as Lord? Will you trust him as your provider, right? Exodus 16, 4. Then the Lord says to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread down from you from heaven, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not so a little bit of context here to set this up the the jewish people were an agrarian people they could not just open the door and drive about a mile down the street and go to Publix and have anything that they could think of there. They had to harvest it. There was harvest time and there was not harvest time. So to, you know, for you and I, maybe it's a little bit easier because if our groceries run a little bit low, we just go grab a little bit of money and we go down to the store and we can instantly get pretty much anything all the time that we want, right? So this isn't the case. They're used to this mindset, not of daily provision, but of, of harvesting, of storing. So he's telling them something totally contrary to the way that they're used to living. They had to be able to trust him for their daily provision. It was something completely foreign to them that maybe is not so much to us at all. But he's saying, will you trust me afresh and anew every single day? 
he said that they would go and they would have this food that they would be able to collect called manna every single day. And then on the sixth day, because God does take the Sabbath seriously as we do and as you do as you find yourself here today, you're making a priority of setting aside work, you're setting down your cell phones, you're setting down life, and you're saying, I'm going to focus on God, I'm going to focus on his word. So on that final day, they could connect, collect enough food for the two days that would last, right? So he's setting them up up with this test, will you trust me? Um, so we have to ask that question, will they trust him? Yes and no, they do and they don't. They were a rather disobedient people, as one of my favorite men likes to say, that manna was for disobedient people. They were receiving this because they were not really trusting in him, and God was using this as a test for them. So what would happen is every day they would wake up in this cool flake-like substance, that would taste really good, would just appear on the ground. So before, remember this, they would have to go out there and till the dirt. I mean, it is tough stuff. I started putting my very small garden into effect this past week at the house to get ready, and I'm telling you, it is back-breaking work. Just to go put the seeds in a small garden is tough. The older you get, it's even worse. Come on, Jesus. I mean, I was getting up like this last night, like, oh, gosh, this is not going to be good. So, I mean, you go out there, and it, they're used to this very difficult work. Now God's telling them, all you got to do is walk outside. You don't even have to go to Publix. You still have your underwear on. Come on, Jesus. You're just out there, and you're collecting the stuff, right? So they're going out there, and then when the sun would hit the day, it would evaporate, and it would go away, right? But if they would hold more, if they would take more than the unit of measure that he would give them, kind of like a quart size thing was called an omer, and if they would take more than that and try to save it for the night, it would get rotten and have maggots in it by the next day and you don't want to eat that, right? So it would spoil. So trust me for provision just for today. It's a great way to live just for today. The past is gone. Tomorrow is in the future. What the decisions that you make today will affect what happens down the road. Will you live for God? Will you trust God? Will you serve God? Will you put your hope and faith in him? Amen. Now, here's one neat thing that I, I, I really thought about the story. So if I were God, right, and you ever put that mindset, like, if I were God, this is what i do, zap them, whatever it might be, you know, so if people are grumbling and complaining, man, I would maybe give them, like, the bread and water treatment, you know, I'd maybe give them, like, the ramen noodle treatment, you know, like, not give them the best kind of stuff. But God provides for even those in the midst of their grumbling and sin, he loves them enough and cares for them enough that he provides this substance that had all the nutritional value that they needed, that was everything that they needed to live just for today. I like to draw the conclusions and start to draw the analogies to the New Testament. I think this manna that he's providing for them gives us a glimpse of who Jesus is, right? It says in Scripture, John 6, 35, Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. I, I don't know, again, I think some of these scriptures are a little bit harder for our culture to grasp than it might have been for them. Like, we say, oh, I'm hungry, I'm going to die, and you just ate lunch at Burger King or something like three hours earlier, right? <laughs> I'm going to die, I'm starving, I'm not going to survive. You know, oh, I can't drink anything. These are people who had to maybe go dig a well before they could even drink, right? Your water comes on. How many of you, like, today you turned it on and your water actually functioned? Come on, Jesus, right? I mean, we live in this day and age where all these amenities are there. I don't know if we can understand this or we dumb it down so much. These were people who got these words. They're like, I'll never have to hunger again. I'll never have to thirst again. He was speaking to the people using a language that they could completely understand. But I think he's speaking to us today, too, because I don't know about you, but I could go eat, like, all the Chinese food that you think a human being could meet, eat in, like, one sitting. And then, like, an hour later, I'm like, can I have some cookies and cream ice cream? Come on, Jesus, right? I mean, you, we get famished right afterwards. But God's saying, I want to provide for you in such a way that you will never be in need again. If it goes back to the, um, the first miracle, the water miracle, the second miracle is the food miracle. He's saying, 
Find your life in me and you will never have to grumble again. John 6, 51, Jesus would say, I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give you for the life of this world is my flesh. That Jesus himself would come to die in our place for our sins that we might have life, right? He would be that substitutionary atonement that would give us this life eternal, this once and for all time sacrifice. Would we trust him? Would we trust him? See, would we put him to the test? Would we believe in the things that his word says? A lot of life is like that, right? But yet we still grumble. We still seek out our own ways. We still think that if something isn't all that bad that we could do it whenever we want to, right? If it doesn't feel bad, if it doesn't feel good, if it feels good, it must not be bad, right? How many marriages have been lost on that statement? How many people have gone out there because it feels good? So they go out there and they enter into some kind of a relationship that they're not supposed to be in. Maybe they're married, maybe they're not married. And then you start to take those sins to the end state of those and where it goes. So yeah, they're married and then they go out there and then they enter into this relationship that they shouldn't be in that shouldn't be so bad because it feels good, but then the girl gets pregnant, right? And then what do they do? to continue to sin even more and cover it up, then they go out there and they have an abortion to try to conceal the first sin and they commit a sin that was worse than the first. And yes, it does have implications, right? But the beauty of our Lord is he's not condoning these actions in any way, that even if you're here and you committed that kind of an action, guess what? God forgives. He still sets free. He could still change our direction. If he loved them and gave them manna when they were in the midst of their sin, do you think he won't provide Jesus for you in the midst of your sin to change your destiny? He did it for them. He did it for me. He did it for Mary Jo. He did it for many who are in this room. And maybe you're one here who he wants to do it for this very morning. See, because if I'm honest with you, one of the things that you're going to find in this life, if you haven't already figured it out, especially if you're a bit younger, there's nothing in this world that ultimately satisfies completely. There's not enough food that you could eat. There's not enough drinks that you could drink. There's not enough places that you could travel to. There's not enough people that you could sleep with. There's not enough music that you could listen to. Nothing in this world completely satisfies. Solomon said it in scripture as well, did he not? He said everything under the sun, you know, it's trivial. He's tried it. He had all the money that one could have. He was a king with every luxury and every pleasure that he could ever have. Why do you think so many of our celebrities end up dying, right? Why didn't they end up killing themselves? You would think they got the peak. They got all the money. They got all the women. They got all the planes. They got everything that you could think of in an earthly sense, and they're empty. And God knows this. And he says, come, seek after me. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Psalms 34, 8 says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you, his holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Would we find our rest in him? Would we come to him with a spirit of gratitude? Why do we open up our dinner tables and we say, Lord, thank you for this food. Thank you for providing for us today. Are we serious when we say it or not? Think about it. When you're at the dinner table tonight, you're like, hold on a second. I got to pause for a second. Right? Do, I, think, I think in our culture, we take that for granted. When people first said those things, it really meant something. Thank you, Lord, for this provision. Thank you, Lord, for providing for me. Would we get back to a spirit of gratitude when things aren't going your way, when you feel like grumbling, maybe go out there and make a gratitude list. And say, Lord, here's the things that I really have to be grateful for. I've got my health. I've got people in my life who love me. I've got a relationship with you. I've got food on the table. I've got a place to lay my head. I've got a car that drives. Thank you, Lord. Would we be blessed and not say, oh, man, I need that new car smell that comes along with the payments that will go on forever and ever and ever. And apparently, I just learned this week that that new car smell is actually toxic is what they were saying, right? It might smell good, but it's toxic for those of you who are on Tuesday night for the, the, food, the food thing. But all these things will never satisfy. I have one last set of scriptures for you today. Isaiah 55, starting in verse 1. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. 
And he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money on that for which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me here that your soul may live, and I will make you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and a commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, a nation that you did not know. You shall run to you because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found call upon him while he is near would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes father may your word today be a call to us that you would put in our conscience in those moments where we find ourselves being selfish in those moments where that ugly spirit might rise up and say, what have you done for me lately? Or that spirit might rise up that say, what's in it for me? Lord, in those moments, would we remember? Would we remember verses that say, taste and see that the Lord is good? Would we remember your glory? Would we remember your mercy? Would we remember the things that you've delivered for on us in the past, Lord God? May we not put them by the wayside, But in all these tests, in the moment that they come, would we say yes and amen? Would we say, Lord, we trust you. We trust you with our very lives. We trust you with our salvation. We trust you as our Lord. Lord, may we find comfort and solace in our relationship with you. May we find peace. May we find joy. May we desire to read your word, as Mary Jo was talking about. May we desire to spend time with you. May we be fully satisfied in you. Isaiah 55, 7 says this as well. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. So I come to you this morning, and if this kind of a spirit has ever plagued you in your life, might this be a morning where you lay it down and you just say, God, I don't want to live that way anymore. I want to live a selfless life. I want to live a grateful life. I don't want to live a life where it's all about my wants, my needs, my desires. Lord, would you set me free from that? If that's you, I want to pray for you this morning. I want to pray for you that God would release and renew your spirit as he promises in his word. Would you trust him in that? I'd also like to pray for you if maybe you wouldn't call yourself a believer in Jesus Christ, but today you just feel the Lord tugging at your heart saying, man, I want to serve you and live for you all the days of my life. If that's you, I'd love to pray for you too. Maybe a third group. If you're here today and you know today's a day where you need to rededicate your life to God, man, we'd love to celebrate that moment with you this morning. So if you're of either of those three groups, you, you, you've been a little more selfish than you'd like and you'd like God to touch you this morning, would you raise your hand? you need to surrender your life to Jesus this morning, would you raise your hand? If you need to rededicate your life to Jesus, would you raise your hand? If that's you, would you do that right now so I know who I'm praying with? Anybody in here? There ain't no selfish people up in here? Come on, Jesus. I find that very hard to be true. I'll raise my hand first for that one. Lord, I thank you and I praise you. We thank you for your presence in this place this morning. Father, in those areas of our life where we're selfish and self-centered, would you renew our hearts and renew our minds father would you cause us to catch ourselves quickly and remember and be grateful for what you're doing father i can't thank you enough for the ways that you've tried to work that out in my life in fear and trembling lord jesus would you continue that work until the day that i go on to be with you my heart's desire is to image you well Lord, I believe it's all our desire that we would represent you well here on earth. So would you remove from us those things that are not of you? We realize where the source of that comes from. It comes from the forgiveness that comes in a relationship with your son. He truly is 
the bread of life. He truly is the water that comes from heaven. And Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for coming and saving us. We thank you for coming and delivering us. We thank you for setting us free. And Lord, from this day forward, we just declare as a congregation that you are our Lord and we will live for you every waking moment. Lord, we take you at your word. We pass the test. We love you. We praise you and we give you glory in Jesus' name. And everybody says, Amen. give God a little bit of glory today. God bless you guys. Thanks for being here. Go sign up for one of those greeting teams back there and go meet the people from Seamark Ranch. Have a wonderful day. Pick up some of these cards, invite somebody to church, and bring them with you next week.